Let's talk about Rawls. People still seem to. Um, maybe we'll see the dawn begin to bloom behind me as I do this. Maybe not, though. Um, yeah, I guess I think that I've destroyed Rawls' theory of justice in a fairly simple way. All right. And it's definitely in a way that uh, only an anarchist could have done. Only an anarchist could have seen. Now, of course, there have been anarchist style critiques of Rawls or at least, uh, you know, Nozick's famous libertarian uh, critique of Rawls. Just, I mean, for one thing, Nozick just points out that Rawls is a statist. That is like he needs a state. The original contractors are going to constitute a state, even though Rawls basically doesn't say that, which is a bizarre elision. Disingenuous, I say. I mean, the first thing the theory of justice should be is the defense of the, the existence of the state in the social contract tradition. It really should, right? That, I mean, and it, nothing could be easier. You just say these original contractors would have constituted a state. And Rawls obviously thinks they would. All right, so just say that, Bubba. And now you have a uh, 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 an argument for the legitimacy of state power. But I also, Rawls wants to go beyond the 17th century, which would be a good idea, all right? We already have 178 arguments for the, for the legitimacy of state power. It's true that none of them are adequate at all or even prima facie plausible, okay? Really, really, all right? But given another one in 72 is the height of boredom, especially because it's gonna be a familiar liberal style. Social contract view, all right. Now, okay, so I think there's a terrible contradiction at the heart of Rawls's theory of justice, and you can see it easily from an anarchist point of view. It's like, it's, it's grotesque in a way. <laughs> All right. Now, so I guess I'm going to read a paper version of this. I, I guess I had this, this kind of developed this critique uh, in Against the State, which was published in 2006, eight. Uh, I ran a version of this argument, kind of a nascent brief version. In Entanglements, 2016, I ran a longer version of it. Uh, and I've broken it off into a paper, but I can't really get the paper published. Or I haven't really tried that hard, I guess. Uh, also, who needs another refutation of Rawls? But I think this one shows a lot. So I actually, I'm going to read it. I thought I would just wrap through it, but then I figured this, this paper puts it the way I think it should be put. So... Let's do it. On a contradiction in Rawls. Justice and anarchy. Justice and anarchy on a contradiction in Rawls. The simplest way to put this, I guess, is that Rawls can't constitute a state. He must constitute a state by his own account, obviously. He cannot constitute a state compatibly with his own principles of justice. He cannot. And yet he requires a state. So I would say that at a foundational level, the whole thing collapses and it collapses quick in a way that's not surprising i mean and and few people could be more irritated with rawls than me i guess in a way although i don't hate his politics as much as i hate a lot of people's politics he's not a fascist right on man right but boy like slogging through that writing it hurts and that's what it's supposed to do i guess you know it's the most infelicitous, uh, it's just a grinding, infinite, gratuitous technical presentation, in my opinion, okay? All right, now, but wh whatever it is, there's a contradiction at the heart that flops the whole thing over like a, what flops? All right, justice and anarchy on a contradiction in roles. In my view, enough and more than enough has been written about Rawls as a theory of justice. Indeed, it has been attacked and refuted and revived so many times from so many different angles. 
uh, including by Rawls, that it would be, so to speak, rational to replace it on the shelf and not pull it down until some decades or perhaps millennia have passed. However, I regard the criticism, this criticism, as fundamental. My own, of course. Uh, both as expo exposing a contradiction or at least an extreme tension in Rawls's account and as showing something fundamental in political philosophy, namely the problematic nature of state power with regard to the matter of justice. I mean, so this is maybe the edge of a longer argument that the political state is incompatible with any plausible conception of justice. So, I mean, I, I would say philosophers, political philosophers, either answer me or be an anarchist, okay? Now, I realize that will destroy your career, your credibility with your friends and shit, but still, you're rationally obliged until you answer this problem, okay? If the existence of the state is conceptually incompatible with any plausible conception of justice, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? And it's not exactly a academic uh, question. Look around you. What are some of the just states? All right. Um, the objection can be stated briefly as follows. Really briefly. You know, I address your thousands of pages, Rawls, along these lines. Political power or authority is, by Rawls' definition of good, a good for every person. Political power is a good for every person. Indeed, it's a fundamental good in the sense that it's a presupposition of other goods. It's necessary in order to secure, to be secure in the other goods, such as material welfare and self-respect. Um, those things that Rawls regards as absolutely vital goods of human life. If, you, However, the political power that is constituted on Rawls' account of the decisions of people in the original position to achieve justice also entail that they constitute an inequality of political power, of political power so severe as to compromise utterly the security of the other goods that they rationally want to achieve. Another way to put this is that there is a tension within the principles of justice concerning equality. The power constituted to achieve a just degree of equality, qualified by the difference principle, is incompatible with that equality. The power constituted by the original contractors to achieve a just degree of equality, that's their goal, qualified by the difference principle, is incompatible with that equality. That is the reason that they went into this in the first place or their most fundamental insight or something like that. All right, first section is called primary goods. And what I'm trying to establish is that political power is a good in Rawls's sense. And according to Rawls, although not, but if it is, a, if political power is a good, according to Rawls, the rest of his theory of justice flop, flop, flops collapses. All right. Rawls writes, for the present, this is the 99 version of the theory of justice. For the present, it should be observed that the two principles of justice, I guess we could review that. Maybe I even have a lecture on this from my political philosophy class or something. Uh, the two principles of justice are a special case of a more general conception of justice that can be expressed as follows. So this is like the most general formulation, or I mean, actually, it's one of dozens of formulations, but uh, he's presenting it as a very general formulation of his theory of justice and seems to be all social values, liberty and opportunity, income and wealth, and the bases of self respect are to be distributed equally, unless an unequal distribute distribution of any or all of these values is to everyone's advantage. As a first, okay, say that again. This is a version of the difference principle, or this is a version of the whole theory of justice in a sentence. All social values, liberty and opportunity, income and wealth, and the bases of self-respect are to be distributed equally unless an unequal distribution of any or all of these values is to everyone's advantage. 
As a first step, this is Rawls continuing. Suppose that the basic structure of society distributes certain primary goods, that is, things that every ma rational man is presumed to want. These goods normally have a use, whatever a person's rational plan for life. For simplicity, here's the primary goods. Assume that the chief primary goods are at the disposition of society are rights and liberties, powers, powers and opportunities, income and wealth. Later in part three, the primary good of self-respect has a central place. These are the primary social goods. Other primary goods such as health and vigor, intelligence and imagination are natural goods. Imagine then a hypothetical initial arrangement in which all the social primary goods are equally distributed. This state of affairs provides a benchmark for judging improvements. And then the difference principle is what qualifies the absolute equality. Uh, if certain inequalities of wealth and organizational powers would make everyone better off than in this hypothetical starting point of absolute equality of goods, um, then they accord with the general conception. Um, the serial or lexical ordering of Rawls's principles of justice does not allow an exchange of rights and liberties for other social goods or powers for that matter, probably, such as economic or social gains. It's interesting that Rawls in this passage includes powers among the primary goods, a theme to which he does not return, although I, might, I probably haven't read everything that Rawls ever wrote because it hurts. Um, but surely, given both the general characterization of goods he gives above and the more specific formulations he gives later, powers, or at any rate certain powers, are primary goods. Indeed, like liberty and opportunity, power may be said to be a primary primary good in the sense that it stands as an empirical precondition for the pursuit of various other goods. Notice, for example, that wealth, security, opportunity, and self-respect are historically connected to political power. I can think of no society, for example, wherein the group that exercises primary political power is impoverished, even in cases wherein the society as a whole is impoverished. In such circumstances, indeed, the strong man is usually stashing the country's wealth in his Swiss accounts. And it is a familiar point as well that exclusion from political power is incompatible with self-respect or educational equality, for example. This sort of criticism was fundamental to the civil rights movement uh, as regards voting rights. Martin Luther King Jr. and many ar others argued that without minimal political power exercised through equal access to the electoral process, Black people in America could not make themselves secure in any other way, could not secure their rights and liberties in it, you know, if they had no political power. Pretty common sense. Exclusion from political participation, they also argued, compromised self-respect and dignity among Black folk, as did the system of apartheid in schools and other social contexts. African Americans came to achieve legal equality in such respects through the exercise of political power in various ways. Okay, so here's the problem. I, I met John Rawls, you know, I saw him speak, he had a bad stutter. Uh, and Richard Rorty introduced me to him and stuff like that, for what that's why. I didn't know, but I met him. Uh, thus it is clear that by Rawls' own account, political power is a primary social good. That is, and if so, the theory of justice fails. If political power is a primary social good, the theory of justice has a contradiction at its heart. That is, political power is obviously something that a rational person would want. That's how Rawls defines good. Uh, and it is subject to procedures of social distribution. Political power is a good that can be and will be distributed. Okay, that's the other question. It's a good, all right, it's a primary good, but will it be subject to distribution? Um, the reason that within Wallace's system, political power is subject to social distribution is because on his account, the persons in the original position must constitute a state, which is a structure of offices, that is, of, according to Aristotle. You know, it's a structure of political power. It's a distribution of political power. 
That's what a state is. One thing that a state is. Rawls, I would say, is not perfectly clear on this, that the people in the original position are going to constitute a state. Yet it is perfectly clear. As Nozick argued elaborately in his libertarian critique of Rawls, Rawls must constitute a set of institutions with the power to make an initial distribution of goods and to oversee the future distribution in order to keep them roughly in line with the principle of justice. This will require, at a minimum, that the institutions thus constituted have the power to take certain goods from some person, persons and give them to others in order to enforce equality or liberty and opportunity and to ensure that pri of liberty and opportunity and to ensure that private exchanges or confiscations of other goods redound to the benefit of all. We can only confiscate your stuff when that's to everybody's benefit. Wait, is this going to work out? The everyone's benefit thing? The benefit of those least lowest down was a more plausible version than this later Rawls. But anyway, uh, in Rawls, the political institutions or institutions of the state appear to be, as we might put it, impersonal. They're portrayed as forces or procedures, in particular structures of rules, rather than as consisting, in, par in part at least, of a, of a group of persons. However, surely the state consists in part of actual human individuals. It's amazing what you have to say to status, you know. Uh, individuals who are themselves part of the population to whom rights, liberties, wealth, opportunities, powers, and other goods are to be distributed. So the people who operate state power are part of the population to whom the goods must be distributed in accordance with the theory of justice, with the principles of justice. Um, in this case, they will... You know, they they're, they are subject to distribution by themselves, according to the principles of justice. If powers are indeed goods, and if political power in particular is a primary social good, then the assignment of political power to these persons, persons who wield state power, is itself a distribution of goods, which is subject to the principles of justice. But to the extent that the individuals who operate state power are necessarily empowered politically to an extent that others cannot be, by definition, they are. You know, the governor is of Virginia is operating state power that by definition, I, who have no official capacity in the state of Virginia, do not, of course. Um, okay. Um, then the question of whether it is just or not would appear to turn on whether this unequal distribution of power redounds to the benefit of all. All right, so we're going to give a large degree of political power to a certain set of people by whatever procedures, election procedures, or whatever it may be. We're going to form a, bureauc a bureaucracy, right? Or, you know, I don't know. I don't want to beg the question in favor of bureaucracy. We'll form a tyranny or whatever. We'll form some kind of state. Um, now, with that distribution, where we distribute all the political power, essentially, or most of the political power to the people who operate the state, is that distribution, could it be made compatibly with the principles of justice? Can you constitute a state compatibly with the principles of justice? Can, constitute a state considered as a distribution of political power or offices, for example. The situation offhand appears extremely unpromising. The distribution of political power in a situation where a group of individuals constitutes the state is unequal. But the political power is it, but political power is itself the power to distribute the other goods, education, healthcare, etc. To the extent that people tend to pursue their self-interest, that is, to the extent that they seek the greatest possible quantity of goods even if this desire often observes certain limits, we should expect that the resulting distribution of all goods will favor those who exercise political power. Indeed, Rawls's own view is precisely that rationality consists in the pursuit of the good. I think that's false, or it's incredibly simplistic. But if it is anything like true, uh, then we should expect that asymmetrical or prima facie unjust distribution of political power will be followed by an unjust distribution of all other social goods. So you, first of all, you can't distribute political power in accordance with the difference principle, all right? 
or the principles of justice. Um, and second of all, you can't, uh, you can't um, distribute any of the other goods according to the uh, principles of justice once you have constituted the state, because this, this political power is the power to distribute the other goods. Um, furthermore, the situation is fundamentally irremediable. Since the distribution of goods is made by those who have already achieved an unequal share of the power to make such distributions, there is no recourse short of continuous insurrection. Indeed, the, the power to distribute will increase as, as it is put into the hands of those who distribute it. And the more unequal the distribution becomes, the more unequal it becomes unto eternity. This, I believe, is a conceptual incoherence at the heart of a theory of justice, but it is, of course, anything but an academic pro problem. It could not be more obvious that the ruling elite, class, race, gender, religion, caste, and so on, of any given society, assigns itself an inordinate share of the menu of goods. And even if one distributed political power, not according to any of these arbitrary categories, but according to desert, or by lot, for example, the people thus assigned would quickly constitute an elite, a class, a caste, and so on. That is, according to Rawls, the persons in the original position have already constituted a profoundly hierarchical society in their distribution of political power. Yes, they have. And one which, other things being equal, will become ever more hierarchical in the fullness of time. Yet another way to put this is that the original contractors cannot constitute a polity that realizes the principles of justice without constituting a polity that massively violates them. The original contractors cannot constitute a polity that realizes the principles of justice without constituting a polity that massively violates them. Now, on the other hand, there may be no recourse. That is, the asymmetrical assignment of power and resulting hierarchical distribution of goods, of all goods, as a matter of fact, typical of all state-ridden or state-addled societies, may be the best we can do. That is, it may be to the benefit of everyone. This leaves us in a position in which no situation, social situation can be expected to produce anything but profoundly unjust distributions of goods. That, of course, may be the case, and perhaps we ought to, ought to merely face up, or for that matter, give up. Um, here's a section called Just Institutions and Coercion. It's truly remarkable that with regard to this massive work of political philosophy, neither power nor state appear in the index. Indeed, I mean, I guess I was looking, I don't know which edition I was looking at when I made that point of theory of justice. Indeed, any general arguments that Rawls gives for the legitimacy of state power are, we might say, superficial. And a theory of justice, we might say, deploys itself without the presumption of the legitimacy of state, within the presumption of the legitimacy of state power. It assumes it, rather than, as in traditional social contract theory, devoting itself to the task of trying to establish it. Nevertheless, it is clear that Rawls constitutes a coercive state. This entails that, among other things, the original contractors are distributing political power, or at any rate, setting out principles or procedures according to which it will be distributed. Rawls defines institutions, including state institutions, in terms of rules and behavior in accordance with these rules, rather than in terms of powers of some persons over others. That is all very well, but these rules concern uh, themselves concern, among other things, the conditions under which some people can legitimately coerce others. That is, though at least in ideal circumstances, the group of people who operate political power do so according to a set of rules and procedures, they do so through coercion. They possess political power that rests on force, force to which the people not part of the institutional apparatus have no access. They possess political power that rests on force, force to which the people not part of the institutional apparatus have no access. Quote, Rawls, it is reasonable to assume that even in a well-ordered society, wherein principles of justice are universally agreed on, the coercive powers of government are to some degree necessary for the stability of social cooperation. Even under reasonably ideal conditions, it is hard to imagine, for example, a successful income tax scheme on a voluntary basis. Such an arrangement is unstable. 
The role of an authorized public an, an authorized public interpretation of rules supported by collective sanctions is precisely to overcome this instability. By enforcing a public system of penalties, government removes the grounds for thinking others are not complying with the rules. For this reason alone, a coercive sovereignty is presumably always necessary. Always, everywhere, every day, every house, I guess. I uh, Rawls indeed argues that the original contractors will want to constitute a paternalistic power, that being rational, they will want to hedge against the possibility of their becoming irrational through mental illness or addiction, for example. Quote, the parties adopt principles stipulating when others are authorized to act in their behalf and to override their present wishes if necessary. And this they do, recognizing that sometimes their capacity to act rationally for their own good may fail or be lacking altogether. In doing these things, the parties constitute other persons as political authorities, not only to enforce rationality on themselves, but to determine whether or not they are in fact rational. They constitute others as well as authorities over their goods, for example, their incomes. Such authority is to be exercised according to the rule of law, which makes the persons thus authorized subject to the rules they enforce. This, I submit, is impossible in that, uh, in that in being constituted as the authorities who, for example, determine the extent of the rationality of citizens, these authorities are by definition exempted from judgments concerning their own rationality. Ra or rather, there may be a hierarchy of such paternalistic authorities, each level of which answers as regards their rationality to those who operate at the higher levels, one level must, but one level must be exempt from the judgment as to its rationality. And in non-ideal circumstances, the parties are simply placing all their social goods at the mercy of other parties. Not something anyone in the original position would rationally do, so they couldn't constitute a state. But my argument here does not rest on such observations, richly concern, uh, confirmed though they are by experience and history. What concerns us here is that since the segment of the population that wields political authority has access to coercive power, that is, uh, that is, as is evident, sufficient to redistribute social goods and strip them entirely from those judged irrational, this coercive power is sufficient to be practically irresistible. The distribution effectively distributes all political power to one segment of the population while stripping it entirely from another. In order to assure a just and rational distribution, Rawls' just institutions presupposed a radical, unequal distribution of a particularly fundamental social good. That is, the distribution of social goods in accordance with the principles of justice is practically impossible. The distributive mechanisms or institution contradicts the principles on which it is itself supposed to make that distribution. Anarchy. If indeed the original contractors were making a distribution of political power, they could not constitute some of their number as political authorities with access to course of power. Thus, I assert they would have no choice in the original position but to choose anarchy or they could not compatibly with the principles of justice, which they already decided upon, let's suppose, constitute a state. So they're either stuck or they're gonna to try to figure out non-coercive arrangements for us to live together. Um, this is evident. Um, thus I assert that they would have no choice in the original position but to choose anarchy. This is evident if we keep in mind that political power is the mechanism by which other goods are distributed. Once they have distributed political power itself in a radically unequal fashion, investing some with it, some with it entirely and stripping others of it completely, they would expect that the distribution of other goods would come to mirror the distribution of power. The fact that once political power is clearly seen to be a social good, Rawls' original, con the fact that once political power is seen to be a social good, Rawls' original contractors would be constrained to choose anarchy, anarchy would seem to constitute a reductio ad absurdum of his theory of justice. But that would be true only if anarchism was absurd. So I picture people in the original position coming together, getting way stuck 
about how we're going to distribute political power and compatibly with the principles of justice coming to the principles of justice. I don't think they would like that necessarily, but uh, the original founders come to the, the, the principles of justice. Uh, and then they ask themselves, then they, they, they try to figure out how to constitute a state that can distribute the goods according to the principles of justice. And they realize quite quickly that that state constitutes a uh, distribution of political power completely incompatible with the principles of justice. All right, so then they're totally stuck. And what I would say is they need informal, non-coercive mechanisms now, non-state mechanisms, social mechanisms. I mean, I guess what I think I've just demonstrated is that the original contractors, exactly as Rawls described them, could only choose anarchy or would give up. And they should. All right. I guess Rawls is in revival or whatever, you know. Uh, so I guess I took it out, out before the millennia, I plucked the theory of justice off the shelf before the millennia was over. We're over. All right, I guess that's me this morning. I'm going to try to do another crisper roots here, but I can't find good stuff. So few new releases.